I got the big podium today. It's nice, y'all. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome. My name is Sam Jean-Francois, and I'm a first-generation Haitian-American student here at Bates, majoring in Africana Studies uh, with a concentration in racism. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us today for MLK Day. Um, black activism is innately beautiful, resting on the demand for humanity, the love for our differences, and the act of reconstituting life in the world that deems black people dead at birth. Reflecting on this year of grief, loss, and radical resistance, we could think of no other way to enter this year's discourse on racial justice than at the intersection of arts and activism. Be it through the works of Asada Shakar, Josephine Baker, Spike Lee, No Name, Toni Morrison, Angela Davis, Opal Timetti, Samaria Rice, Marsha Payet No Mind Johnson, Prematurely Taken, Alua Toyin Sulua, and DeAndre Joshua, or today's keynote speaker, Keith Hamilton Hobbs, black activism has reshaped our capacity to love, listen, and care for one another in restorative ways. With this in mind, I urge all of you to take part in the act of living today. Complacency is a technology of white supremacy. It teaches us that racialization, exploitation, and globalized anti-blackness are natural parts of life, rather than the disruptors that they truly are. Students, don't view today as a break from class, but as a continuation of our duties as active agents of change. Engage with today's workshops. Challenge your peers to think differently. And most importantly, take what is discussed today and place it at the forefront of your life. White supremacy is not a black or brown issue. It, alongside coloniality, impacts every single one of us. And it will take all of us to end their violence. Faculty and staff, remember that today Remember today that learning is an ongoing process. As members of the inherently white supremacist field of academia, I challenge all of you to hold yourselves accountable and reflect on meaningful ways to center equity, access, and justice in your teaching models, regardless of your respective fields. Activism is about community building, uplifting voices, and radical love. And I invite all of you to build community with me today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna declare this the biggest crowd we've ever had at this occasion on MLK Day. Of course, I, I haven't been here since uh, 1885. I think there was a while until sometime in the late 60s or 70s before we had this occasion. But since I've been here, this is an amazing crowd and I wanna welcome all of you, um, especially our guests from the community, um, some high school students who usually come here. So I just wanna make sure everybody feels part of this day. I am Clayton Spencer, president of the college, and I want to thank each and every one of you for braving the elements to be here today. It is absolutely wonderful to be in community with all of you in person, in this place, on this day. It's a day for sensible footwear and a day for us to come together to embrace and extend the legacy of Dr. Luke Martin Luther King Jr. I want to give profound thanks to those who have made today possible, the MLK Day Planning Committee. It takes a prodigious amount of thought, time, and effort to bring about the rich slate of offerings that are being shared with us today. And this is all done by people who have day jobs, including the students on the committee, who somehow also have to complete their classes and get their degrees. I want to particularly thank this year's co-chairs, Assistant Professor of Envir Environmental Studies, Tyler Harper, who you just heard from about the cell phones, and Technical Director of Theater, Justin Moriarty. You have all done an exceptional job, and we are very grateful. I also want to offer special thanks to Brenda Pelletier, who, as a member of the campus events staff and the MLK committee, takes the lead on the immense amount of work to coordinate the multiple, crucial, maddening details 
that make a day like this a success. I also want to thank the many other staff members from dining, events, facility services, and grounds who prepare the campus for this occasion. And many thanks as well to all of you who lead and take part in the many workshops and other sessions that will constitute our celebration today. I would also like to take a very special moment to welcome a special guest, um, our new Vice President for um, Equity and Inclusion, Leana Ames, who doesn't join us until next month, but wanted to come and partake of today's activities. Leana, if I could ask you to stand, I know people would be thrilled to meet you. This year, our theme, as you have heard, is art and activism. Throughout the day, we will consider these two terms and their relationship to one another, how they intersect and diverge, how they energize and expand each other, how they can combine to affect meaningful and transformative forward motion, especially in the realm of justice. We are fortunate to begin this work today with our keynote speaker, Keith Hamilton Cobb, an actor and playwright whose work engages with these ideas in profound and compelling ways. Mr. Cobb will be introduced more fully in a few minutes. As I prepared for this year's MLK Day events, I spent some time reading about what others have written on the theme of art and activism. I was especially taken with a short essay by Darren Walker, written as part of a 2019 issue of Time Magazine on the theme, The Art of Optimism. Walker, as you may know, is the president of the Ford Foundation. In his essay, Walker begins with a quote from the writer James Baldwin, who said, every poet is an optimist. Walker proceeds to explain how he has experienced the optimistic potential of art in his own life, as it lifted him up, expanded his consciousness, and helped him make sense of his own experience. He writes, more often than not, I find that it is art's defiance and empathy, its defiant empathy that shakes me and wakes me up. Art that shakes us and wakes us up. The point that both Baldwin and Walker seem to be making is that art, the creative act, in whatever form or medium it may occur, is inherently an expression of belief in something different or better for ourselves and our worlds. Art in this framing is activism, is activism. A poem or a painting or a dance or a song is, by definition, an act of making, an act of doing, an act of making meaning. Art lives on the frontier of social norms and it refuses to embrace the status quo. In so doing, it broadens our experience, expands our field of vision, and deepens our understanding. It also, again in Walker's words, inspires and emboldens us. It can connect us to one another and build momentum for change. Art may imitate life, Walker goes on to say, but it also imbues us with a radical kind of hope for each of us, for our communities, our country, and for generations to come. Throughout the day, the workshops and panels and presentations across campus, we will have many different lenses to th through which to think and listen and learn together about the relationship between art and activism. We will explore together the power the arts bring to further Dr. King's legacy in the struggle to create a more just world. I hope that you will all take advantage of the many opportunities that today makes possible. I will now turn the podium over to Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies, Tyler Harper, our MLK Committee Chair, and will, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. I'm Tyler. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, as Clayton mentioned, we have a wonderful day of workshops and events before us, uh, starting with our keynote presentation, which is going to begin just in a few minutes here. Um, before I turn things over to our speaker, though, whom I'll introduce momentarily, I wanted to say a few words uh, about our theme for this year, art and activism. In his autobiographical writings, Martin Luther King Jr. identified an essay read during his freshman year at Morehouse College that marked a key turning point in his political education. The essay was not, as you might imagine, the work of a sociologist or political scientist. Rather, it was the work of a poet and political activist, Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience. As Dr. King would later recount, quote, in, his, in this courageous New Englander's refusal to pay his taxes and his choice of jail rather than support a war that would spread slavery's territory into Mexico, I made my first contact with nonviolent resistance. Three years later, in January of 1947, King, then a junior at Morehouse, would continue the role, continue to consider the role that art and activism should play in our educational system. In an op-ed published in the Maroon Tiger, Morehouse's student newspaper, the future civil rights leader reflected on the mission of higher education. It seems to me that education has a twofold function to perform in the life of man and in society, he wrote. The one is utility and the other is culture. He went on to warn that an education that prioritizes utility at the expense of culture, quote, may prove the greatest menace to society. The common criticism of the arts, of course, is that they lack utility. Reading Octavia Butler cannot teach us how to build a suspension bridge. Miles Davis won't help you pay your taxes or write a line of code, and Shakespeare might be of little use in the operating room. And if this is what we mean by utility, the kind of knowledge that can mend a broken bone or set an algorithm running, then it is plain enough that the arts are not always focused on providing utility in this narrowly defined sense. Yet in that early Morehouse essay, King warns that utility alone is not enough, that the mission of a college education is not just utilitarian. Education, the soon-to-be reverend declared, must produce more than individuals who are well-equipped to grease the gears of society and run it with efficiency. Rather, an education must also cultivate character. It should teach students not just how the world is, but invite them to consider how the world ought to be. This, for King, is the role of culture and of the arts. Our keynote speaker today is Keith Hamilton Cobb, a man who has devoted his life to education of the sort imagined by Dr. King, an education that recognizes the transformative power of art and activism and of art as activism. Cobb is a classically trained actor who has graced stages and TV screens around the country, known in particular for his provocative engagements with Shakespeare. His critically acclaimed 2015 play, American More, which will be screened in a workshop this morning, confronts the difficult legacy of race in Shakespeare's writings and challenges his audiences to do the same. Keith's more recent work, a project called Untitled Othello, was the subject of a recent residency at Sacred Heart University and continues this line of inquiry. I know I speak for the entire MLK committee and Bates College as a whole when I say that I'm delighted to have Keith here with us this morning, and I am profoundly grateful not only for the talk he is about to give, but for the three workshops he will be putting on this afternoon. I would like to conclude these brief remarks by thanking all the students, staff, and faculty who make this day possible, and Keith for getting our day started with what promises to be a thrilling keynote. With that, I will turn things over to you, Keith. There it is. Uh, I was talking, leaving the uh, interface service last night, I was talking to Cameron and Noah, who asked, which side do you want to speak from? Because everybody last night had spoken from over there. And I looked back and forth and I thought, when in the remainder of my life am I ever going to be given the opportunity to mount this exalted height and <laughs> offer down my epistles? So with, with, with gratitude and humility, I thank you for indulging me. This is, this is extraordinary. Good morning. Good morning, thinkers, uh, truth seekers, evolving thought leaders, creatives, and dreamers. Good morning, and I thank you, Bates College community, for inviting me here to mark this day in communion with you. 
As introductions will have already divulged, my name is Keith Hamilton Cobb, and I am an actor and a playwright. I am those things among others, uh, though none more notably than those in the common eye. And those not nearly as notable as I might at times wish they were. I believe most people uh, deep within their solitary hearts would like a legacy of note, not all perhaps, but a great many, uh, to, to have uh, contributed something of unarguable value, uh, something determinant to the world. And there are a great myriad of factors beyond talent and determination that contribute to the visibility, if not the perceived value of any individual legacy. If I have purpose in life, the preponderance of time spent around the work of writing and performing, and sometimes speaking in forums like these, would suggest that somewhere there it exists. This is what I do. Later in the day, if you'll join me, we'll have a look at a play that I wrote and performed about an insistence that non-white perspectives matter in the making of American theater. You would call it an indicting socio-political drama with comic elements. It tends to move people deeply in solidarity or piss them off completely in denial. No differently than our contemporary political discourse. No differently than what we are. Hopefully that is testament to its true reflection of the circumstances around societal, particularly racial dysfunction that we find ourselves existing within, that we have never not existed within. It was a play that needed to be written. Relevant theater that stirs dialogue, frightens people, and unsettles staid structures, thought, and practice needs to be written. I was tasked with writing that one, and at least that one time, I was gifted with the tools to write it. So I did. Later, several of my colleagues and I from the Untitled Othello Project, and that is these three gentlemen in the second row to the right, uh, we uh, invite you to join with us and to take the conversation uh, that that sociopolitical drama presents a step further. Uh, I should say, just further in introducing them, these are three very brilliant black men. And the very fact that they are such uh, compels me to exhort you, if you pass them throughout the day, to approach and inquire of them, and they will tell you things that you never considered. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, but yes, we invite you to join our diverse, uh, marginalized voices in discussion about what Shakespeare as an American art form means and doesn't mean to us, what it should look like, and how to manifest it through our communal lens. And uh, just a side note, I believe your program states something like all workshop participants will be asked to read Othello ahead of time. Please don't let that deter you from being present. The only prerequisite is that you have a body and a mind and a desire to be in community. The theater we make reflects us. You, whomever you are, are part of that reflection. There is always magic to be conjured in the untitled Othello room, and I exhort you to come. But all that is a bit later. I must begin here today with an admission of utter incompetence, or if not incompetence, then at least an acute sense of unworthiness to speak in commemoration of a man of such unfathomable greatness as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I feel at once highly unqualified, for there is little that my simple oratory skills could offer that would rise to do justice to so singular and profound a legacy. 
In preparing to share these comments with you, I read extensively to augment the vastly abbreviated legend and legacy of the Reverend Dr. King that had been handed down to me all my life. You know, uh, the bus boycott, the March on Washington, I Have a Dream, the Lorraine Motel, yeah, easy markers in the arc of an imperative and inevitable, drastically consequential life. But I found that the reading only served to ever more vividly paint the portrait of a human being so unique and peerless in his moment upon the earth as to render every accolade, descriptor, and platitude that I might utter glaringly insufficient. I stand here before you feeling insufficient. In so big a world, amidst so many prolific and brilliant minds, like yours, I often feel insufficient. Simply not enough. And if any of you here today have felt a similar feeling, I'm here to tell you that you are not alone and that it doesn't mean that you are not essential. You are. Mostly my research on the Reverend Doctor left me in a ponderous funk, left me to contemplate the infrequent phenomenon that is the, the striking of an individual early in life with an, an acute sense of radical purpose. The gift, or perhaps the misfortune, of knowing certainly and innately not what one might do, but what one must do. But further, and even more rare, to be handed a boon to mitigate that burden, to be endowed as well with a set of physical, intellectual, and psychological tools to deftly and dedicatedly implement courses of action in service to that purpose, leaving you with no excuse but in the words of Dr. King to rise up and live out the true meaning of your creed. And you see, there I am already, rather than to be able to cognize and share with you the staggering significance of the historical figure that was Martin Luther King Jr., I, like most lesser figures, immediately default to the strip mining of his memory for quotations, most often out of context, uh, to fit whatever the, the rhetorical need. I'm capable of better. I'll refrain from the practice any further. This one indulgence, however, I believe is opposite. What is the true meaning of your creed? The annals of history show us fairly few of these, the true meaning of whose creed is discerned and life dedicated to at an early age against the backdrop of the masses of humanity that comparatively and cumulatively do little more than well, expend the great blue globe on into its inevitable death. Many not unreasonably, like to stand the name of Mohandas Gandhi next to that of King. I would add the prophets Jesus and Mohammed, Abraham, but also Greta Thunberg, X. Gonzalez, David Hogg, Alexei Navalny, others, all hearing the voice of authority from within and being irresistibly compelled, perhaps with reluctance, but ultimately with conviction, to honor it, come what might. I ain't one of these. I am not that smart, that talented, that brave, that acutely perceptive to be unequivocally, un unequivocally communicated with by some higher power. And these are but a few of my insufficiencies. I am by turns envious and relieved that this is so. I am convinced that I am not here to change the world unless, and I hope this is the point, unless my tools are commensurate with that which I have been tasked to do. And that the change that I am here to effect requires me only to be unflinchingly true to who and what I am. If that is the case, then it seems to me I have far fewer excuses to not be king-like or even Christ-like. 
to say yes. Dr. King earned a Bachelor of Divinity degree from Crozer Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania. There, clearly compelled and driven, evidenced by him having already gained a degree from Morehouse College before the age of 19. <laughs> Who does this? One of the early influences to shape his theology was the 19th, early 20th century theologian, Walter Rauschenbusch. Rauschenbusch evolved and espoused the idea of the social gospel. Simply put, that there is no Christianity without altruism. No true Christian practice that does not incorporate a preeminent concern for the welfare of one's fellow human beings. Not simply the spiritual welfare. It was shameful, he and King both believed, to profess concern for a soul if one couldn't care less about the human being that contained it. And nothing ran contrary to these ideas more than American capitalism, which had exploded out of the industrial age and the cotton-producing South, concretely placing profit over personhood and individual advantage over the actual cultivation of loving community. So powerful was the advent of capitalism and the guilt-absolving narrative spun up around it so impacting upon the fragile and frightened human being and psyche, so potent in its ability to silence the better angels of all natures by leveraging abstract sums of wealth against them and deadening the capacity for compassionate thought, that here we remain, some hundreds of years later, hoping to discover who we are, each of us, amidst a rabidly capitalist culture that perceives us not as individual human beings essentially needful of love and embrace, each with a divinely inspired purpose on this planet that only love and embrace will nurture, but all as either consumers or labor, and most often both. For most of us who are not Dr. King, who have not had the experience of an extreme revelation to guide us, it is difficult from within the, the miasma of living our prescribed American lives, ever more manipulated by digital technologies and the consolidation of power and wealth into the hands of an ever-shrinking few, to know who we are and why we are here. Are we here to work for Amazon or just buy from it? Ever-increasing numbers of people around the globe are doing one or the other, or both. And it strikes me that there can't be much of a purpose in that for anyone other than Jeff Bezos, whose wealth could literally, literally end world hunger, but who would rather launch his friends into space, while somewhere else, modest people on fixed incomes send more money than they can afford each month into the insatiable abyss of human need because a still small voice within says, do this. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Well, foremost, I am honoring the energy of being asked for. I was asked to come. If I am unable to discern my purpose, I can at least listen to the voices, sometimes loud, other times quite faint, that request my presence. There is surely some purpose for you wherever you are wanted. That purpose might only be discernible to you after you've shown up. You may even find that the need for you in a particular place at a particular time is not to support but to disrupt the what is. And the voices that called out for, your, for you, hoping you would come to help, might be quite shocked to discover your actual purpose because they were not expecting anything like what would happen once you arrived. So listen hard and say yes, no matter how humble the ask. Your yes is your way of speaking your purpose into existence. 
What is worth you showing up 110% for? The theme of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day observance at Bates this year is art and activism. But I find those words limiting. And I would like to suggest two things. I would like to suggest that when we say art, what we are actually talking about is creativity. Your creativity. That is to say, your innate ability to think and innovate with an open heart beyond the cycles of earning and buying and earning and buying the little boxes that capitalist structures conspire quite successfully to keep us in. It might need nurturing, cultivating your creativity, but know that you are by nature a creative, a maker of something other than what is. So this is not an address to the artists, per se, the student of chemistry, of philosophy, of Africana studies, of whatever discipline calls to you, in whatever wilderness you wander, you are all creatives. And none the least of what is being created in your wandering is you. Activism, well, when you begin to think and innovate beyond the capitalist structures in America, one morning waking up to the idea that there might be a way to apply your tools to a more socially conscious, more human-centric future, you are at once an activist. And your activism, as it becomes actual, as you self-actualize, while it is ultimately what is best for the social evolution of our world, will not be taken kindly. There is far too much money at stake for little old you to disrupt the network of industrial complexes that keep us here comfortably oblivious to any greater purpose beyond aspiring to successes within them. There is a theater industrial complex that has nearly nothing to do with the generation of transcendent, culturally nourishing art. I'm in it. There is an education industrial complex that has nearly nothing to do with the generation of brilliant free thinkers whose ideas will change the trajectory of a dying democracy on a dying planet. You are in it. Perhaps not here at Bates. Uh, private colleges can manifest in any number of ways with varying degrees of humanity forward. And this college is capable of doing its own honest introspection. But should you pursue a postgraduate degree, I shit you not, you will most certainly find yourselves on the consumer end of another shameless money grab masquerading as your shot at a future. There is a healthcare industrial complex, a religion industrial complex, and there is you, poised to fly in the face of all of it should you discern that that is your purpose and that you care. And even after you realize that that is, in fact, the awareness you have come to, you still have to say yes. Being holy unapologetically who you are is activism, especially now when we can all see so clearly how unabashedly all threats to the antiquated cultural status quo are being vehemently resisted. The structures that govern, I dare say, oppress the citizenry with psyops and strategies of tacit and overt violence were meticulously designed and built by moneyed white men for moneyed white men to be what they are, to withstand question and assault, to last forever. Moneyed white men and those that they can keep indoctrinated by perpetually pressing the absurd American narrative of noble intent are active in keeping those structures unchanged. And it, it could be reasonably argued that being one with that antiquated cultural status quo is, in fact, wholly who one is. There are plenty whose raison d'etre is to ensure that everything remains absolutely unevolved. 
As American demographics change, so does this dynamic. The problem is that this process is slow and perpetually resisted by ever more unscrupulous brokers with ever more undemocratic tools and tactics. It is only an equal and opposite activism that will affect change. But this is not a political speech. And I don't suggest that any particular brand of activism is your job, or that if it is, it needs to be huge or sensational or internet worthy. Rosa Parks simply said yes to saying no. And nothing was ever the same again. This is simply to say that should it one day dawn on you that it is your job, as inconvenient as it may be, you say yes. Meanwhile, how do you discern with honesty the altruism of your activism? That's a powerful and highly inconvenient word, altruism. It means self-concern, selfless concern for the well-being of others. Not what will happen to me if I help him, but what will happen to him if I don't. It is often said that politics is a life of service. The same is said about law enforcement, medicine. But I'll wager there's not a single politician, nor cop, nor physician with selfless concern for the well-being of others. I'm not talking about some concern, or even considerable concern. Think on the idea of selfless concern. And Dr. King seems to have come quite close. Ultimately, however, it is as unachievable as unconditional love, but world-changing on a cellular level if everyone were to diligently pursue it. A worthy life's purpose. Activism is, by its nature, self-sacrificial. And your ability to show up fully when your time comes will require that you nurture a deeper, more fully compassionate humanity. How will you employ your innate creativity to do that? And where do you start? And when? Nothing but more of what this is that we're living already comes of your silence. Nothing but more of what this is that we are living already comes of your silence, your complacence, your doubting of your own intellectual agency, your stifled creativity. Nothing comes of your playing small. And this that we're living is purgatory. Neither heaven nor hell, it is designed to be just comfortable enough for you to forget that you don't like it. That is its very definition and its inherent danger. Here is where unexceptional societies go to die. Then, you arrive. Somewhere, in these weeks now upon us, depending on what you observe, is the Feast of the Epiphany, or the, the revelation of God as Christ. Now, before I continue, I want no one to misunderstand me. I am not a Christian, and I believe neither in messiahs nor gurus. I do very firmly, fervently, however, believe in the power of love, the power of the human, and the Christian gospel as metaphor. And I am able to look at the lives of both Jesus and Dr. King as metaphors for my own and yours. These are not my delusions of grandeur, as I have already confessed that the manifestations and enormity of purpose for such iconic men has me questioning my very significance. But, as tis the season, please indulge me while I, I just examine the paradigm of the child in the manger for a moment. 
Ostensibly, he will grow to be a very particular child who, even if he performs in his life not a single storied miracle, will disrupt entrenched old thought, religion, and business practice meant to keep power and money in the hands of a few. That should sound quite familiar to you by now. He will wander in the wilderness, be tempted by powers that will suggest that he might live an easier life. He will pose grave threats to powerful people. He will waver in his dedication to perpetually putting himself in harm's way in pursuit of a principle. He will want often to say no, but he will inevitably always say yes, and then he will be killed. Talk about the inconvenience of purpose. King begins his life similarly. While among the African-American community of 1930s Atlanta, Georgia, he might have been considered well off, something was clearly and gravely wrong with the society into which he was born. And the violent resistance to change intrinsic to that society was no less absolute. Again, if you're looking, it should appear familiar. Out of this he grows. He as well is offered easier ways through life educational positions that would leave him comfortable and quiet, places to ply his formidable skills where they wouldn't always be seeking to expose what was utterly unacceptable but unchanging about a horror-ridden America wanting to be left alone to hate and visit bloody destruction on black people while celebrating its own goodness and perfection. He will pose threats to US presidents and to the entire hierarchy of white supremacists arrayed beneath them. More than once, he will share Jesus' Garden of Gethsemane experience. For those who do not know that story, the garden at the foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, where it is said that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. In prayer, it was said, he asks of the inner authority that compelled him, if you are willing, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. He asks that the cup of purpose be taken from him. How many times has that been you or me asking, can someone else be me? Can someone else live the life that it seems I am supposed to live? I want a different one. I am afraid. I say it all the time. But then he says yes, and nothing is ever the same again. So back to the manger and you. Even those among you who are enjoying a relatively privileged existence, it is only because you have grown used to the depth of dysfunction that we all live within that you are not more alarmed. Remember the definition of purgatory. Privilege is an odd thing. There are those things in any given Monday for a person who is well off to complain about. To one who is destitute and disadvantaged, those same things in that same day might barely be worth a mention in that there is so much else about which to be concerned. But if you asked either of them, they would simply say, it's Monday. Whichever of those you be this Monday, there you are, in either case, a divine idea, never one like you before and never to be another, born into the world and into each new day, not to perpetuate sameness, but to create change. And if you listen, you can hear the bleating of sheep If you take a deep breath, you can smell the stale hay and goat piss. The dysfunction is all around you. It awaits you, 
either to grow into and along with it or to speak up and speak out with whatever your tools in whatever your moment because nothing like you would show up here without a reason. That reason, your activism, will be a manifestation of self-actualization. Because most of us are not those who are struck with a purpose of undismissible magnitude and further bestowed with the tools to execute it as Dr. King was, if we are going to come to it at all, we must cultivate our compassionate awareness. First, through perpetual introspection. How am I showing up? What am I to do today? What is being asked of me? How can I say yes? Why am I afraid? How do I overcome it? What is the highest good? Not my will, but yours be done. Then through self-care and self-love, discerning, owning, and defending the truth of yourself is a political act of defiance in resistance to an old, monstrous machine devoid of ethics and built of countless generations of responsibility to humanity abjured from. It knows nothing but to perpetuate itself, and it seeks to define you to suit its own ends. Your successful resistance, your activism, however you affect it, is an example of responsibility to something greater than yourself. It doesn't matter that you can't define completely what it is. It is creative altruism. The idea that your creativity is in service to humankind. You serve the world by cultivating your tools of creativity that you apply in the process of becoming more holy you. That process is one of being radically introspective, honest, radically self-loving, for you can love no one if you don't love yourself. Unapologetically forthright, and by saying yes to the totality of you, the divine idea. Let your divinity infuse everything that you write, that you paint, sculpt, sing, dance, design, concoct, produce. Let it inspire everything that you say and every interaction that you engage. And give no one a pass. That is to say, once you have done the work to know what it is, speak your whole truth with all your voice. Emerge from the wilderness and deliver your epistles irrespective of who is ready to hear them. You are the bringer of light and change, not the jackass whisperer. All men and women and the non-binary are not created equal. It's nonsense. What we are is equally human. In some form, even the most advantaged, least marginalized among you will struggle. In some form, you will suffer. I would posit that we all suffer together this moment in a purgatory wrought by our equally flawed human tools. This is life, the Buddhists would say. I don't disagree. But too many have made their lives about the avoidance of discomfort, rather than saying yes to the life's purpose that is revealed to them. Your radical yes need not be of the immensity of Martin Luther King's. A journalist friend of mine, Richard Rosendahl, in response to these remarks said simply, one of the callings many of us have as activists, while falling short of revolution, is to interrupt the self-flattery with lightning flashes of clarity and truth.
Never for a moment imagine that your clarity and truth is not without consequence for all of us, as well as for you, or any less necessary, essential. Take it upon yourselves to honor the energy of being asked for. The art is the self-creation of you. The activism is your forever resisting the belief that that creation is ever completed. Say yes. Everyone, uh, my role is to be brief and to close the program and to tell you when it's time to go. <laughs> I am James Reese, Associate Dean of Students for International Student Programs. First, I'd like to... <laughs> First, I'd like to thank Keith Hamilton uh, Cobb for pertinent um, and poignant presentation that we will all take forward. So please give it another round of applause. <laughs> In my brevity, one um, note for the program, the noon scheduled Bates Voices in the Fireplace Lounge of Commons will be moved to 1230. The noon program is moved to 12.30 to enable workshop participants to complete those workshops and actually the Bates Voices participants to uh, move there. So 12.30 is a half an hour program. And second, uh, with the words of this morning and with the efforts of the committee and many students and faculty and staff who have prepared all of the workshops and programs of today, it is now time for all of us to go forward and take our inspiration from the words we've heard this morning and for your being here, not only uh, for the King Weekend, but at Bates, and, uh, and to make everything happen. And with that, now it is time to go.